Warning. The Not Real Art Podcast is intended for creative audiences only. The Not Real Art Podcast celebrates creativity and creative culture worldwide. It contains material that is fresh, fun and inspiring and is not suitable for boring old art snobs. Now, let's get started and enjoy the show. Greetings and salutations, my creative brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast, where we celebrate creative culture and the artists who make it. I'm your host, Sourdough, coming to you from Crew West Studio in Los Angeles. Man, do we have a cool program for you all today. I have no doubt you will learn, grow, and be inspired by today's show. Before we get into our main event, I want to thank you for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode and subscribe. Your likes and follows help ensure you won't miss any of our new shows, and it makes the algorithm God's happy, which helps us, so thanks for that. Also, be sure to visit our website, notrealart.com, sign up for our newsletter to keep your finger on the pulse of everything we're doing here at Not Real Art for artists and art lovers. A lot of great stuff there. On the website, you'll get free educational videos. You can sign up for our artist grant for the chance to receive $2,000. You can buy affordable original contemporary art through our partnership with Sugar Press, And you can become a supporter through Patreon if you want. So be sure to check out our website today for all the good, healthy stuff we got for you. Now, like I was saying, you're going to love today's episode. But first, I want to shout out to my good friend, Aaron Yoshi, for holding it down in March during International Women's Month here at the Not Real Art Podcast. She did an incredible job celebrating the power of women with several great interviews with incredible women in the arts. It was awesome. I hope you guys heard them all. If you didn't, you got to go check them out. They were incredible. Thank you, Aaron, for taking over and raising our game here at Not Real Art. You rock very hard, my friend, and you've made my job even more challenging now because I've got to try to keep up with you because you raised the bar. So thanks so much, and we can't wait to have you back. Okay, now here's what we got for you today. Unless you've been living under a rock, the letters NFT probably very familiar to you. NFTs are like the shiny new thing, but uh, are they a trend? Are they here to stay? Are they going to democratize the art world? Are they going to change the game for artists? Are they going to revolutionize the careers of artists by shifting power away from the existing stakeholders back to artists so that artists get paid and get paid into perpetuity every time a piece of art sells in the secondary market? I don't know. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, NFTs are exciting. They're built on exciting technology. The blockchain's incredible. Cryptocurrencies are fantastic and amazing, all new stuff, all scary stuff. You know, it's exciting, but a little dangerous. You might lose your shirt, but then again, you might become a billionaire. Who knows? Feast or famine, right? But NFTs are really cool because the way they are designed and written, artists can create commission structure to get paid a certain percentage on any sales into perpetuity, which is a game changer for artists, but NFTs are new. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of excitement. It's the wild west right now. It's uh, a lot of hype. So I thought we'd spend today's episode trying to sort it all out. And so I brought two people in much smarter than sourdough to help me understand all of this and who we have today, two amazing guys. They both are alums from deviant art. One of whom has been on the show before, Joshua Waddles, was the chief advisor at DeviantArt for 15-some years. Josh Waddles is an intellectual property attorney with a deep insight into copyright law and intellectual property law. And he's also been on the podcast before. He spoke at our conference. He's written for our blog. But then he invited Tom Rollinson to come and join us for this conversation. Tom, or former DeviantArt staff member, but basically Tom's like us. He's a huge art enthusiast, but more to the point, he's the co-founder and director of Laura Zombie Studios, previously Eyes on Walls, DeviantArt, McGraw Graphics, or some of his previous gigs. But Tom is working with Laura Zombie, who has been successful at creating and selling NFTs. And she has a great following as an artist out of Canada. Anyway, love her stuff, love her great energy, fantastic person. But Tom is very generous to join us and share his wisdom, as well as Josh today in our conversations about NFT. So get ready because you're about to learn. Tom Rollinson and Joshua Waddles, welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast. Thank you. Thanks. 
Well, so Josh is our returning champion. He's been here before. So I'm honored that we haven't scared you away, Josh. At least you're back to talk about a subject that I know really interests you. Tom, you as well. You know, I'm a neophyte when it comes to NFTs. NFTs are like the shiny new object that people are fascinated by these days in the art world. A lot of exciting things about it. But I think there's also a lot of question and concern and it's exciting, no doubt. I wanted to have you guys on to talk about NFTs because, you know, as I've already said, I'm a neophyte. I know a lot of our listeners have a lot of questions and confusion around it. You can't go on Clubhouse these days without bumping into a room. But Tom, so I want to start with you because, you know, you have experience in this marketplace. I believe you've created and sold some NFTs. Is that correct? So talk a little bit about your experience. Let's just start with that. Let's level set. Start at the beginning. When did you start looking at NFTs? When did you actually make the jump? So I work with a popular artist. We run an e-commerce brand around her work. We do shows, sell prints, all that kind of stuff. And so just from being in the business and having a lot of people that follow what we're doing, I would say the first time I heard about crypto art was probably three years ago. And then about two years ago, I had talked to someone sort of very briefly about it. And this was someone who was very into cryptocurrency, who wanted to kind of put it on our radar. I think at the time I'd looked at it and it was so early. I kind of regret not getting really deep into it then because obviously it would have been a great advantage if we did. I just couldn't fully get my head around it. And then through last year, there started to be really a lot more activity happening, started to hear about it a lot more. And around December and the beginning of January, I was like, okay, I really want to get into this and try to understand it. So obviously, crypto art really ties back into blockchain and into cryptocurrency. Obviously, cryptocurrency has been a huge topic. So actually, what I found interesting was that sort of starting from the perspective of crypto art and understanding that and how it works, and then moving backwards into blockchain, I was able to actually really like fully understand the value of blockchain and really like understand cryptocurrency a lot more. Like I think for people who are a little bit more creative minded or work in product development and stuff like that, you know, coming into blockchain from the perspective of crypto art really helped me understand the whole purpose of it a lot better than when I was trying to understand it kind of which most people do from like a financial perspective. So I would say like around January, I really got deep into it, kind of really started to understand it. Definitely came away with the conclusion that blockchain is the way that I look at it. And maybe this is a super simple way of looking at it. But if you think of the internet as being about sort of like information, communication, access to information, blockchain is really about ownership. And I think I really came away from getting deep into it, thinking that, okay, it really makes sense that at some point in the future, the ownership of basically everything is going to be controlled and managed by using blockchain technology. And so it seems like what's happening is that crypto art or art collectibles and digital collectibles in particular are kind of like the first major category of that starting to happen. But I think it's going to expand into tons of other things. Like I think in some point in the future, property and anything that has sort of like ownership or title involved is going to be managed using blockchain technology. I sort of got deep and sort of took on that basic understanding of it, I would say in January. And very soon after that, NFTs just exploded. Like if you look at the charts of sales volume and the marketplaces and how much activity there is, it went absolutely through the roof in January, February, and I believe is continuing even into this month as well. That was it. And then I guess, you know, just working with an artist and always kind of looking for ways, new mediums for her work and ways that we can feature and sell it. We sort of started on trying to figure out a strategy for getting into actually selling some NFTs. Without getting too into it, there was kind of a few different ways that we thought of approaching it. What we ended up doing is working with a marketplace called Foundation. It's invite only. I was able to really hustle. To, these marketplaces are obviously slammed with applications from artists. So I had to really kind of hustle at any possible connection that I could to get into one and managed to get an invite through a mutual friend into Foundation pretty recently. And then we released our first NFT, I think it was maybe a week ago or a little more than a week ago, which was interesting and had 
a pretty successful result, like nothing crazy, but we sold a, essentially a digital file from about a year or two ago for $7,000, which was pretty good. And then I recently had my first experience with purchasing an NFT from Nifty Gateway. There's an artist, I think they're a collective called Friends With You that did a collaboration with Diplo. And I happened to enjoy the work of Friends With You. They did a really cool installation here in Toronto. And so they have this kind of iconic cloud character that's a part of their work. And it was an NFT release for charity, a timed open edition. And so I now own an NFT as well, though I paid a lot less for the one that I bought than the one that we sold. But still, is it? Well, that's just good business. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's right. Tom's always been a savvy business guy, always looking for the deal. (laughs) I try. I try. A value (laughs) investor. Yeah. Tom's always deeply aware of the small margin and the need to make big money with pennies. Good. If only more artists. <laughs> and, well, by the way, speaking of artists, so you work with an artist and I want to pause there for a minute because I mean, obviously you touch on so many things and we'll go back and we'll cover most of them, if not all of them. But, you know, because at our core, we're here to celebrate and elevate artists and honor artists, help them tell their stories. Tom, tell us about the woman that you work with, the artist that you work with, what is your relationship? How did you guys find each other? What do you do for her? I actually know Josh because we both were involved with a company called DeviantArt, uh, which is a community of artists based in Los Angeles. Never heard of it. <laughs> and so that's going back to, uh, I was working there, running there. As you probably know, like it's a social community for artists. Artists can put their work up. So I was working for DeviantArt running their prints program. So basically when you submit your work to DeviantArt. You're also able to put it up for sale. And so I was involved in that for three years. And so Laura was actually an artist on DeviantArt. So I think that was probably how I initially discovered her work. Laura Zombie, by the way, let's be clear. Laura Laura Zombie. Zombie. Yes. Yeah. And so I had left DeviantArt in early 2010, basically to start my own business, working with artists. And essentially, I mean, the part that always interested me about working with artists was basically taking artists that had talent and had developed some following and helping them essentially operate as a business and operate their careers and essentially, especially monetizing their work and being able to pursue art full time and stuff like that. So that was kind of always a part of the business that I was really interested in. And so in 2010, I had left and started a company called Eyes on Walls. So basically working with a whole bunch of artists selling their work, mostly as prints, open edition prints, limited edition, some originals and stuff like that. So I started working with Laura in 2010. She was, I believe, 19 at the time, 19 or 20. She was living in Russia. She'd been posting her work online and started to build a bit of a following. And she was doing sort of like a limited amount. She'd worked with Gallery 1988 back then, a pretty well-known LA gallery. And, you know, had sort of started to get some traction in her career. And so we started working together, like with a roster of artists Fast forward six or seven years, at the end of 2017, I had sold Eyes on Walls to this investment company minus me and Laura. So they kind of took over the rest of the roster of artists and we had a production facility and and offices and all that kind of stuff. So basically we sold that business minus me and Laura. Laura relocated from Russia to Toronto And we started Laura Zombie Studio, which is basically an e-commerce brand and a creative studio built around her work. So yeah, that sort of takes us through today. We're just past three years into it. It's like, it's a pretty lean operation. We're about six people all together. And yeah, it's been an interesting experience. But yeah, so, I mean, to answer your question, I've been working with Laura for over 10 years now. And I mean, we have done just so much stuff together. It's crazy to even think of just work you know we've worked with tons of different companies we've done solo shows like so our thing initially with eyes on walls was instead of working with galleries we would just rent a gallery space and we'd essentially operate our own show so we did initially a solo show in toronto and then we did one in brooklyn and then one in new york and then we did one in london and then we did a west coast tour that went from vancouver to Seattle to Portland to San Francisco to LA. So like a sort of five city touring art show. You know, we worked with like HBO doing some projects. We've worked with galleries and kind of partnerships. We worked with Demi Lovato on her album launch and did 
artwork for a pop-up event that she had in New York. I mean, we've just done tons of stuff over the last 10 years, just every kind of product you can imagine, apparel, prints, we're doing a book now, we've done vinyl, you know, all that kind of stuff. But big picture wise, I guess really what I've come to realize working with Laura is that artists basically should be operated as their own, in my opinion, direct to consumer brands and that they should think like a business and that they should basically manage their own fan base, manage their own customer base. And I think it's really important that they do it that way because every artist kind of has their own way that they want to approach their work. They have their own unique needs. And I think the challenge I had with Eyes on Walls was having a whole group of artists and trying to have them all in one kind of marketplace when really every artist is different in what they want to do, how they want to be priced, how they want to sell their work. So yeah, that was, that's kind of the journey that I've had with Laura. So one of the cool things that you're mentioning, we'll come back to it because I have a question for Josh, but Laura sounds very much diversified, right? And so it's interesting to think about how an artist such as herself and your team generally thinks about NFTs as one spoke in a wheel versus like the wheel or whatever. And there's this interesting dynamic that's happening with artists who are feeling like, oh, wait, maybe this is the silver bullet I was looking for. But a lot of those artists are maybe not as diversified as someone like Laura, because, you know, a lot of artists struggle with their business or what have you. It's great that Laura has you. But I have a question for Josh, because Tom, I wanted to have you on because, of course, you represent, shall we say, the supply side right, of this economy, right? And of course, you're a buyer too. So, you know, in some ways you're the demand side as well. But Josh, as we all know, because Josh has been here before, he's a lawyer who comes from the intellectual property side of the legal (laughs) system. He helps artists think about, you know, IP and protecting their rights. And, you know, so Josh, I mean, as you've studied this NFT marketplace over the last few weeks and months, you know, as a lawyer, What jumps out at you that maybe artists need to understand about this? Or how is this such a paradigm shift? Well, so I have a very good friend who's a totally distinguished IP guy and uh, professor and knows just about everything there is to know about copyright in particular. And he asked me to explain NFTs to him. And the way I started was I said, look, you have these bolts that hold your neck onto your head so that your brain is connected to your thought process. So I want you to undo all those bolts, take your head off, everything, (laughs) all the wisdom you have in intellectual property, everything you've learned, just lift it off of your head, move it to the side, find a new head, put it on a complete empty vessel, because you're never going to understand NFTs in the context of the system of intellectual property that exists in the world. I was going to say the Western world, but we've now browbeaten all of the world into the concept of copyright and copyright law. And that's what is the foundational protection and support for artists. NFTs bear no relationship whatsoever (laughs) to any of that, but it sets up a very interesting dynamic. Essentially, all the NFT is, is a non-fungible token is what it stands for. I have no idea why they came up with the term non-fungible. But a piece of cryptocurrency is presumably non-fungible as well. It's just that it isn't, in the case of an NFT, it seems to be associated with some sort of unique, different object, which in fact is not unique. But we'll leave that for a moment, particularly if it's a digital object. And the NFT itself is simply the provenance of ownership over that particular token, over that particular expression of ownership. So in the case of a war zombie NFT, it commences with someone with her authority, presumably, minting an NFT, which is simply saying, I am the originator of this token. I've paid to have it become originated by me, and I'm associating it to this digital image. Now, you could associate it to a video file. You could associate it to almost anything digital. I'm not quite certain on whether you can associate it to something that's purely physical, presumably some sort of thumbnail component or image of some kind is required during the minting process. Isn't that right, Tom? Yeah. So it can be tied to a physical item. But only by creating a digital replication of that. But no rights are transferred in the object itself. So you're only transferring rights 
in the token, not in the object. The object will continue to be controlled by copyright law. And one of the sine qua nons of the copyright law since 1978 for an artist, for a visual artist, is that the transfer of a particular copy of a work does not transfer the copyright or any rights under copyright. And, you know, there's only a small exception with respect to public display, but that public display is not permitted even on the internet, technically, under copyright law. So here you have this token that has a price value in the marketplace for these NFTs that way exceeds the price value if you simply just sold a digital file, even if you sold exclusive rights to the digital file. Even if you sold the copyright in the digital file, you would have to find a marketplace that would give it value, and it's not going to reach the value of an NFT. And in the case of an NFT, what you're selling is just this listing of provenance and the assurance that any subsequent purchaser will be added to that provenance, and it'll be, in a sense, a permanent record of transfer. So, you know, that's a very attractive little thing but it's not art. It has nothing to do with art. The art itself is out there floating disembodied, essentially. The digital file that Tom purchased could be repurposed and sold by the originator of that file into infinite additional NFTs. There's really no assurance that that isn't going to take place. The the $70 million, actually $68 million Christie's file uh, that was sold as an NFT No rights, as I understand it, were transferred in the underlying work, which was a composite of over 5,000 little digital memes produced by that artist. So each of those individual works were not transferred. You know, that artist could reconstitute a new compilation and offer it as an NFT again. So why is this happening is really the question. You'd have that same risk even just purchasing a limited edition print or original from an artist. Like there's artists that will reissue the same image again and again in different colorways or different size versions or that's with alteration. If you issue and certainly in California there are laws, I'm sure Canada has similar laws that preclude an artist from misrepresenting an edition. And there's none of that kind of control in the world of NFTs right now. So You know, what fascinates me about NFTs is the people behind creating the buzz. And I had an opportunity uh, a couple of years ago to go to a crypto conference in Puerto Rico and got to meet a lot of the crypto billionaires. (laughs) And they have an ethos. They have a philosophy. They have unofficial but still strongly held philosophical views about cryptocurrency and and how to preserve that marketplace and create that marketplace. And one of their big needs is to maintain a digital world and to do transactions that are purely digital and to not transfer their crypto into real money and to maintain the crypto pool if for no other definition. And so they need things to do with their crypto that maintain the integrity of cryptocurrency. And NFTs, although Some marketplaces allow you to purchase them with a credit card. Essentially, they're taking your real money and turning it into crypto when you do that. And you still need a digital wallet in order to hold your NFT. So these NFTs have the integrity of the digital marketplace that cryptocurrency needs for its own validation. And to me, that is the best way to explain it. They haven't had anything really fun to buy, right? And the big... Places like Nifty, Nifty Gateway, Nifty Gateway, I keep on Nifty Gifty or whatever, Nifty (laughs) Gateway and other marketplaces are funded by huge crypto billionaires, Mark Cuban, the Winklevoss twins, and they're the ones who actually are making the big buys or it's these big crypto billionaires who literally they have hundreds of millions of dollars of crypto or billions of dollars of value of crypto and nothing to do with it except cash it in, which they don't want to do. And so now they've got a marketplace in which to play. And they have these cool little, with a lot of digital integrity, these cool little things that they can flip around and say that they have ownership of. But in fact, 
they don't own the digital works. They just own a token that is associated to the digital works. That's the part that as an intellectual property lawyer or as someone who's been in the arts for years, you just can't understand. I mean, there's just no conceptual framework for that, that it's a token that represents an ownership interest without you owning something in the classic sense. So it's just a very, very strange thing. And it's perfect for crypto because crypto is this incredibly valuable currency that you can't buy anything with, except for maybe a Tesla car soon in the future. Yeah, two things really interesting there. I think the point about just like the sheer amount of value that there is in cryptocurrency really explains a lot. Last I heard, the sales volume on NFTs was, I think, 250 or 300 million year to date, which is a lot. You know, Nifty Gateway, I think, did 70 million in sales volume. NBA Top Shots, I think, is the majority of the NFT overall sales volume so far. When you think about $250 million in volume year to date, like that's a lot. But in the world of cryptocurrency, which I think Bitcoin is close to or in the range of a trillion dollars of value. Crypto you know, altogether think, is $2.5 trillion. Yeah, over $2 trillion in value. So I mean, it, I can understand where the money is coming from. And I think the other thing you said, Josh, about, and I'm coming to it from the same thing, and I think probably this is my resistance to the idea initially, is just the idea of, as someone who collects art and likes art, having that kind of physical representation as the part of it for me. But if you really think about it, particularly if you think about the collectible aspect of it, if you put an NFT up against another collectible, like say a sports trading card or a limited edition Nike shoe or something like that, the NFT actually does check a lot of the boxes versus the physical collectible. And I think for people that are really just focused on the ownership and on the speculation of value, the physical item in a sense can be a bit of a burden because there's the condition of it, there's having to insure it, there's having to transfer it to the next buyer, there's authenticity, provenance. When you look at these collectors that are collecting, let's say, shoes, they're never wearing those shoes, they're never using those shoes. Those shoes are wrapped in plastic in a dark room in a box somewhere in their place. So, I mean, I can understand that when someone just wants to collect things, speculate on the value, have that pride of ownership, say, yeah, I own that limited edition thing that only two other people can possibly own. I can get my head around that part of it. And I can see how NFTs do create kind of like a very efficient, very easy collectibles marketplace. I think that's the primary appeal of them personally. uh, Yeah, there's another aspect here that is fascinating about NFTs that to me really distinguishes this particular bubble, which is that typically the artist gets abused on some level. That's sort of the sine qua non of most distribution of art is you start with the person who creates it, like the writer of a movie, and you make sure that they have the least interest at the end of the day financially coming out of the experience. And that's obviously very true in the visual art. And so these NFTs that have smart contracts, you know, based on Ethereum platform that allow the artist to build in or the minter of the NFT, hopefully the artist to build in a continuing royalty on new transactions is really, really fascinating because it creates essentially the only market that I know of in visual art, in music it's different, where even as the work decreases in value, as long as there are transfers of the work taking place, the artist will continue to get a share of the proceeds. I mean, that's pretty amazing. You get a share on the way up, you get a share on the way down, you get a share on the initial issue. That's a pretty fantastic deal for the artist. And if the price in return is, as you get to watch a bunch of crypto billionaires toss your art around like little pieces of popcorn, essentially, who cares? They don't own the art and they have no copyright in the art. So you can continue to practice what is your field with your own integrity and have an enormous amount of creative control. And once the lawsuits start flying on display of these crypto things, it's going to be really fascinating. I mean, the copyright law is pretty clear. You know, the right of public display is one that stays with the copyright owner. It's not one that gets transferred. So uh, certainly not by an NFT associated to a digital file. So, But this is a key point. I want to clarify something because what you just said, if I understood what you just said, Josh, like I could buy an NFT, 
I have this smart contract that says I own this contract that says I own this piece, but I cannot display it. I have not bought the right to display that file. Yeah, and unless there's something in the contract that says you can. But nobody's going to stop you from displaying it. Why? Because the artist wants to get continued transactions on that NFT because they're incentivized if they have a follow on royalty to have that, you know. Look, Shepard Ferry just came out with an NFT where a portion of the proceeds automatically go to uh, Amnesty International. And that's just a terrific vehicle. You know that Shepard Ferry NFT is going to get bounced around. So that's great. But as soon as these things get still and stop bouncing around, you know, it's sort of like musical chairs, I think. I'm not quite sure, actually. I I had detached my head, so my (laughs) old wisdom is completely unnecessary and useless. Not even relevant. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's interesting, though, seeing some of these artists like Shepard Ferry or recently I've seen some of the kind of known gallery type. Artists. Ron English just got involved. Yeah. yeah. OK, so Ron English, there was Philly. Jeff Penn, Soto. Ron, Jeff Soto. Yeah, a lot of these. But what's interesting is that the artists that are really thriving and doing the best with this in terms of, you know, if we consider sort of just sales volume and dollar sales, the sort of key measure, it's really artists that are natively digital. I mean, obviously there's a superstar Beeple. I mean, it's artists that have never been able to realize any value really for their work through all the traditional means. A lot of artists that like they're well known for digital, they create this amazing stuff they post it essentially on Instagram and they get some likes and some follows. And a lot of them do commercial work, like how they're really paying their bills is by doing work for hire, doing commercial work, doing commissions, things like that. So it's been interesting to see a lot of artists, the sort of artists that are really running the show right now and doing the biggest numbers are artists that had no other real way to monetize their work up until now. And now the value that they're extracting for their work is just unbelievable. You know, it's mind blowing. And that goes to the validation of the digital universe, right? I mean, that's what makes this a a genuine sort of now moment, right? A genuine detached from the art world as you may have known it in the past completely and totally is that component. I mean, yeah, Shepard Ferry is just sort of like a side writer. Yeah, like Ron English did one recently on Nifty. I mean, I think he did sort of six figures in sales volume, which is obviously incredible. But I mean, there's... Artists like uh, Mad Dog, who is uh, someone who I hadn't heard of before NFTs, that did almost $4 million on a release. And that artist would not have nearly the same clout in negotiating with a gallery or doing a gallery show as someone like Ron English would. So it really is a new... Well, and it also defines the audience for these, because the audience for these are people who hold a lot of crypto. And the type of people who hold a lot of crypto come from gaming and other digital environments. And that's the artist that they would have come into in touch with. That would have been their aesthetic standard would have been these digital artists. But I have to wonder, did they even give a shit? I mean, is it a matter of the fact that early bird gets the worm? So these digital artists who were there, right, happen to be the first ones that you could buy from, right? So did the purchasers even care that these guys were the OGs of digital art? I think it depends. But I think in general, like if you look at the let's put aside all the reasons that someone would have spent $70 million or well, 60 million plus a buyer's premium on that Beeple piece at Christie's. I think like if you put aside possible reasons of bolstering the entire market, the nefarious that, dubious okay, reasons. So if that, we put yes. aside that, if yes. we just look at, at someone as an art collector who would want to buy that, if this is the beginning of a movement that's going to last forever or for years to come, which I think it is, the artists that are a part of that movement and this sort of chapter in art and the early ones, then they're the ones that are really going to have the most value, especially in the long term, you know? So I think for sure, the artists that are kind of staples of igniting this movement are the ones that are getting the most kind of collector value and most likely the ones that are going to retain their value or increase in value over the next five or 10 years as well, you know? So. And this is classic, right? In terms of art history, artists that are practicing their art suddenly become in vogue And God bless these digital artists who are now getting their moment. I mean, I'm thrilled for them. They're getting attached to a movement as well. Like Banksy's an artist, he created, he built that. But I mean, I think what really bolstered him huge was street art became this huge movement. And he was kind of not even the first into it, but 
the best known and the earliest. And so I think what Banksy is for street art or maybe Warhol is for pop art, Beeple is probably going to be for NFTs. And there's other people that come in around that artist. And I think we're seeing the same thing with NFTs. But, you know, NFTs are not just about art. They're also attaching to other digital objects like a tweet or whatever with huge valuation on that as well. And Tom, could you talk a little bit about how this all starts with the NBA in a closed marketplace? Because I think of the art impact of NFTs as being completely different from the collectible component yeah, of NFTs. So that's a really good point. Like, I think we should separate kind of crypto art as a category of NFTs to some degree, because I think NFTs as a technology and as a product, we're going to see expand into so many different things. Like it's going to be access to things and experiences. And so there's NFTs as a technology is going to go far beyond art for sure. And I guess we already see that happening. Like, I mean, I think NBA Top Shots is essentially to me like an evolved digital version of collecting sports cards. Like instead of collecting a LeBron James rookie card or a Michael Jordan rookie card, you're collecting a digital moment from a game, but it's being that concept of a digital moment. So, you know, a five to 10 second clip of LeBron James doing a slam dunk or scoring a winning point or whatever it is. And they have a number of them. It's being packaged into a product that's very similar to trading cards where you buy these packs of them and then you open them up and you get them. And when you buy this pack, you're really hoping that you're going to get whatever is the most collectible or most valuable thing. And so what they have really nailed, I think, is like, one, they've got the credibility of the NBA behind it. Two, they have that kind of collectability aspect to it. They're bringing in, obviously, a huge fan base that already exists from the game and from the athletes themselves. And they basically have created a really interesting, really cool digital product slash experience. Like it's a little bit of investing for some people, a little bit of speculation, maybe a little bit of gambling, a little bit of just being a fan of the game and a fan of your favorite players. Like given that they're making up, I think probably the majority or at least close to half of the overall sales volume of NFTs, that model, I think really nailed it. And I think that's really interesting. Like that's the kind of thing I think that we would love to do long-term would be to create a kind of branded collectibles type experience using the catalog of work that we have. And I think I would imagine Nintendo is going to be doing this with Pokemon. Disney's going to be doing this with their Star Wars properties. Like I think we're just going to see a huge explosion in this just coming purely from what would have been trading cards before. And you get in these closed markets, you get a little bit of ownership of the file in the sense that the file is associated to you. That LeBron clip is your clip. Now, the marketplace might issue five of those or six of those or 20 of those. But however many they issue, they'll tell you how many. And you'll know that you have one of those additions and your NFT represents that. So it's a little bit different than these open marketplaces like Foundation and others that currently artists are relying on, where that kind of backbone isn't part of the process. So it's just a completely different application in my mind. One interesting point that I had heard listening to an interview with one of the founders of Coinbase was that in most of these marketplaces, Nifty Foundation, all of them, and NBA Top Shots, it's really the marketplace that's minting that NFT. It's not actually the artist. And I'm not super deep into like technical understanding of this yet, but my understanding is that we're being at least a little bit conscious about what we're experimenting with or starting to release through foundation is that it's something that we're fine with kind of just living in that marketplace and being mostly attached to that marketplace going forward. There's one marketplace called Zora, I believe, where it's actually you who is minting it and you essentially retain some kind of ownership as it being originally minted by you instead of through a marketplace. So my understanding is that down the road, if it goes in the direction of everyone kind of operating their own marketplaces like Top Shot, and I think there will be, that you'll be able to roll in these NFTs that you've sold in the past into that marketplace. Whereas if you've sold them through Nifty or through these other places, at least according to the Coinbase guy that I was listening to, who I'd imagine knows, you're not going to be able to kind of roll it into 
your own platform in the future. So that's something that at least this person was saying was an important thing to consider for artists getting into this is just try to think long term, see through the initial bit of hype, and then make sure that you're not limiting yourself in the way that you're releasing your work now. So don't blast everything out there. Well, and this gets to risk, right? So there's so much excitement and hype around this. It's a gold rush, Wild West. I can't help but you know think about all the folks that got rich in the gold rush selling shovels. And so who are the people getting rich off this gold rush? This isn't free. There's no free lunch here. Where are the costs for artists and what are the risks here? So for foundation, so I'll just go fully by my experience here with foundation, and it does vary from marketplace to marketplace. They're using the Ethereum blockchain. The Ethereum blockchain has what's called a gas fee when you mint. It fluctuates in price, I think, depending on how busy the network is and how urgent the transaction is. But in our case, it costs about $90 US to mint the NFT initially. And then the same again to list it for sale. So it's about $180 in total, $90 to mint it, and again, $90 to list it for sale. And again, I believe that can fluctuate up and down as high as 150, as low as 60 from what I saw for each portion of that. And then the way it works is that when you list it, you set an initial starting price. So we put one ETH, one Ethereum, which is I think about 1500 or 1600 US dollars right now. The way that it works is that it sits there listed in that marketplace. As soon as someone submits an offer for that amount or more, It starts a 24-hour auction where other people can then submit bids. But at the end of that 24 hours, whoever's got the highest bid then becomes the owner of it. And the marketplace took, I believe, a 10%. I have to double check. It was either 10 or 15% cut on that sale. So all that comes down to we took a digital file. We sold it for essentially around $7,000 US dollars. It cost us just under $200 to mint it and to list it. And then... 700, I guess, or something like that to the marketplace. So, you know, we would net a little over 6,000 out of that. If you compare that to selling an original through a gallery, it's pretty favorable to the artist. And again, as Josh pointed out, if that person ever resells that NFT at whatever price, 10% of that comes back to us. I don't believe the marketplace takes a cut on the future transactions. And that's just the rule for that marketplace, the 24-hour exactly. trigger. Like Nifty, I think, is even lower. I think they only take 5%. And there are some marketplaces where the number just keeps going until the person says, stop, I'll take that number, right? I mean, there's no 24-hour limit. Uh, yes. So, for instance, with our NFT that has been sold, now somebody can submit an offer to that buyer of any amount at any time. And that buyer can accept it if they want to, or just ignore it if they don't want to. I believe that it can be submitted not just through foundation, but also through OpenSea and some of these other kind of... And then what about your marketing piece? I mean, how do you market something like that? So I got to say like the trickiest thing for us is really figuring out exactly how to promote this because it's completely different. We basically did sort of a small campaign for it across our social channels, email list blast. I think there was three bidders on it, and I'm quite sure that two out of the three were customers that had purchased original work by Laura before. So in our case for the sale, and we just released another one that someone just placed a bid on that started as well, and that was someone who had bid on the first one too. So... So far for us, we've kind of just been marketing it into our own channels. Like, sure, we put it up on Twitter with the hashtags and we sort of added some of... I went through and looked at all the top sales of crypto art and who the users were and made a list of their Twitter handles. And so when we tweeted out that the auction was coming to an end or nearly ending, we added some of those people. So we tried some stuff like that. I did try... We ran a Facebook campaign and I tried sponsoring it out to, I built an interest group based on our customer profile and then overlap that with people who are interested in cryptocurrency or that Facebook has determined are interested in cryptocurrency and ran some promotion there. So we basically just did what we do with every release and that we try to just shake every tree that we possibly can and promote it as best we can. And that's what we did, but I'm still not really sure what the best way to promote these are. 
The cool thing with an auction is that you only need two people that want it. So in our case, even just having three was enough to bid up the price 7x from what our starting bid was. But I think we're still learning that. But how to actually get kind of on the radar of all these people who are really collecting art and all that kind of stuff, I think that's a challenge. Okay, so this is a key point here, right? Because just because we build it doesn't mean they come. This gets to the uh, gold rush, wild west euphoria of it all. Marketing promotion is always the challenge for any business, any brand, let alone an artist. And it feels like supply here is really outstripping demand, to be frank. And that's one of the risks for artists. Artists are going to spend 200 bucks maybe to create an NFT and try to sell it. Is anybody there to buy it? And to your point, yes, you want to go to your own network first, your own. I mean, that's the low hanging fruit, right? But just broadly speaking, this is a brand new market, a brand new thing. There's a lot of hysteria and hype around it. And people might con themselves into thinking like, oh, if I put something out there, someone's going to buy it. No, maybe no one will. And you just spent 200 bucks. Yeah, I mean, that's where the marketplaces at this stage of the game are coming into it because Nifty Gateway already has an audience of people who are purchasing this kind of stuff. They have a user base. So when they accept you into their marketplace and they create a release with you, they're essentially bringing the customers to your work, which is really no different. Like, you know, back in the day, we used to work with Urban Outfitters to sell stuff through. And I mean, we're bringing a product and content and stuff that sells and they're essentially bringing a customer base and people to see it and people to buy it. And we evolved on from that to a point where we essentially control our own marketplace and do our own promotion and stuff like that. So I think we'll see that happen with NFTs. But for now, I mean, yeah, if you don't have your own following, you're going to have a hard time. And it really depends on the marketplace too, like Nifty Gateway, Every release that they do is getting an email blast to their audience. It's on the front page of their site. They're only doing one or two a day. Foundation, the one that we work with, we weren't really getting much promotional support from them. Like, sure, it's the auction's coming to an end. It's on the front page of their site, and you're in somewhat of a community. But it's a, a bit more like you've got eBay, and then you've got, let's say, Urban Outfitters, or I don't know what a big marketplace is for retail goods. And they're mostly different in how selective they are and how much participation they allow and how much content they have. But you know, I think if an artist doesn't have their own following to tap into, they're really going to want to be getting into one of those marketplaces that's going to put a big push behind it. And that's just a matter of shopping. Tom, when you were shopping for marketplaces, which I know you did, Did you notice an aesthetic buzz to any of them? For instance, someone that really likes Rainbow Kitties and that kind of stuff, the cat playing the piano, I mean, whatever, compared to a marketplace that's trying to promote a Banksy or a Shepherd Fairy or whatever. I mean, those are completely different aesthetic contexts. So did you notice any differentiation? I would say there's some differentiation, but the biggest factor of differentiation, I would say, was just how selective they are about their content and how much content they allow. I would say that's the biggest differentiating factor between marketplaces, at least from my perspective. There's some that like super rare seems to be a little more common that it's just still images. Foundation too, to some degree, I think James Jean had a big release that he did on Foundation and got a huge price for it. I think quarter million dollars or something like that. And it it was just a static image. So I've seen like there's some differentiation on that, but thinking of how this will evolve, I would imagine there's going to be marketplaces that specialize in black and white photography or that specialize in street artists or whatever, you know, I don't see that too much. Like I said, the main differentiating factor I see is just how selective they are about their content. And so how much content they have, you know, and the pickers, you have a sense of who's doing the picking. Yeah. I mean, for Nifty Gateway, it's very much like a cool kids club. I think Nifty Gateway is the biggest marketplace in terms of sales volume, they're making lots of artists into multimillionaires. I'm sure that everyone wants to be there, but they're accepting very, very few. In terms of the pickers, I mean, to me, it doesn't seem any different than buyers for Urban Outfitters or whatever. I mean, they're just looking for something popular. You can see some of the releases that are happening on Nifty are Grimes and They're looking for big names and popular names and things that they think are cool. I I honestly don't think that there's that much focus on the real quality of... And that sort of gets to one of the fantasies about, and there's maybe some truth to it, but about it all, right? Like NFTs and blockchain, crypto is the sort of democratizing force. And the reality is 
uh, at least right now anyway. It's classic favoritism, uh, you know, you yeah. know. It's absolutely, like Josh said, on one hand, to get your head around NFTs, you really got to kind of detach yourself from everything you know, and you got to really look at it from a fresh perspective. On the other hand, there's a lot of same old, same old in here. You know, like when me and Laura are having to go to Nifty and say, please accept us, please give us an opportunity. It's no different than when we used to have to do that with big retailers back when we relied mostly on wholesale and on partnerships and galleries and stuff until we finally said, fuck these guys, we're going to do it on our own. And that's what we do. And I enjoy my life so much more since I didn't have to, one, working with those people and two, having to have someone else kind of have their thumb on whether you succeed or how your product's released. So, you know, it's absolutely a cool kids club to some degree. And I think there's a lot of kind of talk about the community and freeing artists and all this kind of stuff. And it's definitely the long-term prospects are interesting. It's definitely helped a lot of artists really monetize their work in a way they haven't been able to before. But, you know, for artists that maybe don't have a huge following, aren't big names, don't have an in, they're going to have just a harder time making money off of NFTs as they would off of anything else. I'm reminded, right? I mean, the gods and the devils are in the details, right? Yeah. And you open the hood on this and get into it or whatever, you start seeing that, oh yeah, no, they're gatekeepers here too. And by the way, like, okay, a lot of artists I know are very conscientious about issues of sustainability and environmentalism. And for example, the carbon footprint of NFTs is a very interesting issue too, right? So it'll be interesting to see how some of these issues get reconciled or not, or do they provide barriers to artists, you know, give a shit? I don't know. Isn't that a weird double think, Scott? To here you are dealing with this completely ephemeral piece of digital flotsam, and you're worried about environmental impact. You would think it was like the last thing in the world that you would have to be concerned about. When you're making a print, a physical print, you've got paints and inks and chemicals and all kinds of stuff going on all kinds of energy use in creating all of those things. And you would think that digital in some way liberated you from those concerns. But then it turns out that the energy consumption required to maintain the blockchain and to maintain the crypto premise underneath all of this is pretty significant. And there are articles on it that suggest that it's having a significant environmental impact. But from what I've heard and understand, I think a lot of that was rooted in people reading this one article that was posted by someone that pointed out the energy impact of the Ethereum blockchain as a whole. And it became super trendy and it went around. And then when we post that we're releasing an NFT, we got all these smarty pants in there posting the article and saying that it's terrible what we're doing. And But I think the reality of it is that absolutely everything in this world, especially digital, consumes tons of energy and produces tons of carbon. It's good, I guess, that people are aware that digital doesn't mean that it's perfect and that it's clean. But from what I heard, the entire Ethereum blockchain is something like 7% or sub 10% of the energy usage of just YouTube, you know, and people are posting these comments in this article to us attacking us on a Facebook post or on an Instagram post. And it's like, well, you don't seem to have an issue with using Facebook and Instagram. What's the carbon footprint impact of Facebook as a whole? And likewise, we release things like apparel and nobody says anything. And I mean, the amount of energy and consumption and effect on the environment that goes into a t-shirt from the initial production and the raw materials and the dyeing and the inks and the transport and all that kind of stuff. It was just a little weird, you know? I mean, the popular article or information source on that, if you go to it, the person actually took it down and kind of said that they were trying to make a point about how digital and energy still consumes electricity and still affects our environment. But basically, this wasn't intended to go and start attacking artists that are trying to explore a new medium. I don't think that anything positive comes from that. I mean, I think if you get into the technical aspects of it, there's evolution to happen. And I think this is something that's going to improve like all technology over time. But people that are using that to go and attack artists that are trying to find a new way to monetize their work to me just seems like, why don't you do that to any artist that's using toxic paints or aerosol paints or producing apparel or prints or things like that? Or why not attack Facebook or TikTok? Or how necessary are those cat videos on YouTube that you have to watch them for it to consume? What about Logan Paul and YouTubers? How much energy is consumed in 5 million views on a Nelk Boys video? Well, we all know that if we want to solve this environmental impact issue, we should just all commit a mass suicide. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like, let's just you know, let's just be real about the true issue here. I don't, I don't know. I think the uh, body decomposition fumes might not be. Good <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So you know, one of the cool things that I am fascinated about the focus is on NFTs, but it's important for us to kind of deconstruct the various links in the chain or whatever, right? Because of course, there would be no NFTs if there wasn't crypto, and there wouldn't be crypto if there wasn't blockchain. And these elements are revolutionary. They're amazing. I mean, I personally remember reading about blockchain, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. And at the end of the day, it was kind of like, well, this is going to be really cool for attribution. It's going to be really good for like chain of ownership. And, and by the way, just the decentralization of data so that you don't have to worry about a one hit taking out a big bunch of information. We're, we're sort of spreading our risk and spreading our information. And so there were a lot of really super cool things about this blockchain technology as a registration, as a sort of system, you know, and then of course we got crypto and what have you, and it's all very exciting and new. And I think that's great. And, you know, I'm also curious though about how it influences the quote unquote real world, right? So for example, one of, we touched on this earlier, one of the most amazing things about this NFT innovation is that visual artists can earn royalties on sales of their work. I mean, this is revolutionary for artists. And the secondary market. And the secondary market. Now, so how is that going to impact the physical world and the secondary market? Will galleries and will Sotheby's and will these other stakeholders now start feeling pressure to identify to this chain of ownership and pay artists royalties? I mean, artists have to start demanding it, but it seems like this could open that up. Well, there is something called droit de suite, which is a fancy French word for the ability to go forward with the work and continue to obtain rights to a revenue stream. And there are laws that control auction houses in London, New York, and Los Angeles, which is why sometimes you see auctions taking place in Cleveland, so that they don't have to deal with it. And it regulates, it's typically only in the auction market, a portion of the sale price going to the artist only in certain circumstances, in certain date brackets. So it's there, but it's really not there. I mean, you know, it's only for super top end artists who are in legitimate auction houses and in that environment. The NFT is revolutionary in the sense that it's built in. I mean, there's no way to avoid it. It automatically goes into your digital wallet as the transaction takes place. Nobody touches it in between. I mean, I can see NFTs and that blockchain technology creating tremendous value for, I mean, I can see why brands like Louis Vuitton are all over this kind of blockchain technology things. Anything that has a significant resale value and that authenticity is a major concern for, I think is going to really be an interesting application of this technology. Like if you imagine a scenario where Rolex watches can be sold at the source by the brand and attached to an NFT so that on one hand, as a buyer in the secondary market, you can be completely certain that you're getting an authentic item. But on the other hand, as a brand, you're unlocking just a tremendous amount of value in that the resale market, you're able to be getting a cut back on every single transaction, I think is going to be huge and really interesting for any industry that has a resale market. So for me, the first that come to mind, like I said, are Rolex or Louis Vuitton, Chanel, like those kinds of brands and that kind of thing. I think it's going to be really interesting to see them potentially operate their own marketplaces and operate their own provenance, essentially, and history of items versus all these other companies like the Real Real and StockX and all these guys essentially coming in and backpacking on their demand, which is interesting to me. I think we'll see stuff like that. Well, that re- sort of reminds me of something I read the other day in passing, and forgive me because I don't remember exactly where I read it, but maybe I dreamt it. <laughs> but, but somebody mentioned along the way that somehow the blockchain and this revolutionary approach to providence and attribution may actually replace the copyright or the need to file a copyright. Josh, what say you about that? Well, copyright registration is something that was abandoned by most copyright regimes as a predicate to obtaining a copyright. And it only really is in the United States and a couple of other countries where registration is still relevant to being able to proceed with a copyright litigation. So the result of that particular dynamic is that when the digital world came about, 
and everyone needed permission to perform things or display things in the digital realm, there was no registration environment to go to to find out who owned the work. And the result of that is pretty much disastrous confusion and an inability to create organized licensing structures, except in certain really sunk industries like the music and film businesses. So it's been a real disadvantage not to have registration. And just look at the volume of content that's produced that's copyrightable. For instance, every single email you send is copyrightable. Every single tweet you send, by and large, assuming it's over two or three words, is copyrightable. These are all copyrightable objects, none of which have been registered. So if you can put together a mega registration mechanism with built-in provenance on transfer, it's great. And then that allows you to track back who owns it. But that would require you to have a public hash, of course, that accompanies the digital object to allow people to track back and take a look at the registration on the chain. So I don't think that piece is completely taken care of. And the part that I don't understand, and maybe Tom, you have some insight into it, is in your Rolex model, how do you take this digital registry, for lack of a better term, and connect it to the physical object? I mean, you still, I mean, one of the big issues in art transfers is provenance is important, and it's important because it establishes history, and history creates a signal of authenticity, but it doesn't deal with the issue of forgery. And the same would seem to take place in the Rolex world and the Louis Vuitton world, where there's so much bootleg content. Yeah, I mean, I in the case of physical goods, I can see there's a lot of activity around how do you create some kind of physical marker on the good that attaches it to that that attaches it to its entry on the blockchain or the marketplace that it's being managed through or whatever. Right. And I mean, I think that that's going to be the challenge for these companies on how they implement that and how they manage it. Because I mean, you know, if you look at something like a car, to some degree, when a car changes ownership, you're forced to, in order to insure it and in order to take possession of it, you have to go to the DMV or whoever's in charge of and the of bin transport. number, the bin numbers on the block, and yeah, yeah. And so I think if Louis Vuitton started attaching NFTs to all of their stuff, I mean, not everybody even knows what an NFT is now, let alone wants to deal with it when it comes time to sell it. And so I think there's going to be situations where these things go, I guess, what will be called off chain. And then for, I guess, the brand of the marketplace, they're going to have to find a way to make it as easy as possible for those transfers to be properly managed through their system. And then I guess they're going to need something where if something gets stolen or disappears off the chain or gets transferred for cash or given as a gift without being transferred properly, that someone can reintroduce that item back onto its original ownership and so on. So yeah, it's all going to take a lot of time. I wonder too, like Rolex, for example, we're getting away from art, I guess, and talking about these things, but the Rolex example, they could be involved in the secondary market of their goods if they wanted to, even before NFTs. So maybe there's some reasons that they don't want to do that and how they want to manage that and if it impacts their brand or whatever. But particularly, you can see that, you know, Tesla don't exclusively handle their own resale. But if you go to tesla.com, you can buy a used Tesla as well as you can buy a new one. And I think with artists, it's going to be interesting too, how they actually implement this from a user and a customer perspective. I think for someone like us, I would like to centralize everything in our business and in our website, including the resale of certain goods and tracking the ownership of originals. So it's going to be a matter of having the right technology and the right interface and user experience to be able to make that work and make it work easily. But there's plenty of incentive on both sides as I see it. Like from the artist side, it's earning a portion of every subsequent resale of your work. That's a huge incentive. And from the customer or buyer side or collector side, authenticity is a huge factor. When it comes to buying art, provenance is very spotty. Even when you're buying it from known galleries and stuff like that, you often don't have like a full history of it. So I think there's huge incentive on both sides to make it work. And I think that it will, but we're in early days now for sure. Well, and part of the early day phenomena, right, is it raises questions of whether or not this is a bubble, right? Raises questions about regulation. I mean, right now it's the Wild West. There's like zero regulation that I'm aware of. So what are the best minds on these matters saying and thinking around 
whether or not are we in a bubble right now? And if so, when might it pop? And second of all, at what point is the fun over and uh, the regulators come uh, running in? With cryptocurrency, the regulators have been standoffish. And the big question in cryptocurrency is, you know, at $2.5 trillion, is it enough for governments to start jumping in to try and seize control because it affects the integrity of their own monetary systems? So, so far, it's really only been tax authorities that have been exercising control, and they've sort of designated crypto to be a security for all intents and purposes, with both short and long-term capital gains being applied to your profit on the crypto, which means you have to prove your basis in the crypto when you're declaring your taxes. So I would think the same thing is going to happen with NFTs, that when you resell an NFT, is the IRS just going to consider that to be a straight sale and income, or are you going to be able to claim that you should have capital gains treatment on it? And I think that's going to be an interesting thing. Nobody regulates the art market. No outside authority comes in to regulate this, never has in the past. And the regulation that you get over media comes from the industries themselves providing the regulatory context. I mean, it's the RIAA suing everybody for downloading that tries to regulate the distribution of MP3s. It's not the United States government or anybody else jumping in to help them. So I don't really see government intervention in the art NFT environment other than in terms of tax authorities, as something to be concerned with. You can't get anything through Congress in terms of changing copyright laws, by way of example. It's a hopelessly mired and politicized environment. And, you know, they're much more interested in stopping Facebook from blocking conservative speech than they are in worrying about war zombies selling digital objects on an NFT market. I would say that the general consensus that I've seen, and I agree, is that 99% of the NFTs being sold right now, possibly more than that, are not going to retain their value in the long term, particularly not increase in value. I think that it's buyer beware, like any investment that's made in collectibles of any kind or art in particular. I mean, if you bought an original piece of art in a gallery 10 years ago, Uh, some nice show that you went to in LA or New York or whatever. And despite what the gallery owner may have told you, what that artist is up to now and what the resale market is for their work is it's a risk. It's a huge risk, especially when you are buying lesser known artists and artists that are just hot in the moment. So I think NFTs are no different. I think that really, if you're buying NFT, well, first of all, you probably shouldn't be buying NFTs as an investment. The one I bought, I certainly didn't think of it that way. I think you want to really think about what is this piece of work and this artist going to mean 10 years from now and project yourself forward into that if you're really trying to think about it as a long-term value. And I think there's a really important distinction to be made between investing in NFTs and let's say investing in cryptocurrency is that NFTs by design are completely unique. Each one is completely unique. So if you buy a bunch of Bitcoin and Bitcoin starts to tank in value and everyone is unloading it, you can click sell and you can liquidate that immediately because a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin. They're all the same. It's just the same value for everything. And you can immediately find a buyer for that usually, even when it's on the way down. With an NFT, you're going to have to find a buyer for that specific item that you have. And It's really, in my mind, going to be no different than investing in originals or investing in limited edition from an artist and how liquid that investment is and what the long-term value of that is going to entirely depend on essentially the market activity and secondary market demand that that artist has. So I think that's just the measure that you need to use if you're you're trying to think in terms of a bubble. That's a huge risk because it requires the marketplaces to be sustainable. And that's a big open question. I mean, I mean, if in a few years, maybe when Beeple has his own platform that he runs central, again, I don't know exactly how this is all working in the background. I'm just going to say as an example, going by what that Coinbase founder had pointed out, maybe artists are releasing their work through their own marketplaces and the initial releases that they did in these marketplaces, they're not able to include in that. And maybe that makes them less desirable to collectors. Maybe it makes it more desirable. I don't know. But I think there's definitely been a frenzy that pretty much anything that was being sold through Nifty or sold through these main marketplaces was just creating these huge numbers. And it was certainly a ton of speculation built into it. And 
personally, from my perspective, I can see that already kind of petering out a little bit. You know, when I think it really dawns on people that there really is like an infinite supply of NFTs that can be made and digital files that can be sold and tweets and all this stuff. So I don't know. I don't know if there's going to be some huge panic and some huge crash. I think what we're just going to see is that some NFTs just fizzle out, which we're already seeing, and they're selling for less than their original value. And then we're seeing others that are maintaining and continuing to increase and setting records. There's one application for NFTs that fascinates me, which is using NFTs as a form of ticket to an event. So I mean, imagine you're a performing artist that wants to do a specific type of performance and you mint 2000 NFTs that would then give you access by presentation of the NFT to be able to see the visualization of the event. And then the buzz around the event and how important it is to see this event. I mean, I'm thinking back in the day of performance art when you had Vito Asconci biting himself under a staircase and screaming. And so something like that, right? And you only mint 2,000 NFTs for that. And for anybody to go see it, they then have to trade the NFT to another person so that that person now has the ability to go see it. So it creates this sort of infinite ticket. It's, I think, really, really fascinating as an application. And there's going to be lots of that kind of stuff that you can do with these once people start engineering backgrounds for it. That'll be really, really cool. Yeah. And further to that point, you know, it begs the question, should we offer this podcast as an NFT? <laughs> All it takes is two interested buyers in an auction format and you never know what can happen. I mean, you know, I haven't heard of a podcast being offered as an NFT. We could be the first guys. Yeah. I don't know, maybe we should just I offer guess. you, Scott. Maybe Scott should be an NFT. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's your answer. Nobody wants me. Therefore, probably nobody wants this podcast as an NFT. But it raises the question, you know, it dawned on me. I was, I was thinking about this. Like, has anybody offered a podcast as an NFT? I don't, I haven't heard that. Yeah. I mean, there is really no limit to what can be done with this technology, even in its current state, let alone what it's going to evolve into. Tom, you want to go into business? <laughs> Because this podcast will drop next Tuesday. That's when this is dropping. I want to get this out post haste. So we'll be promoting it and releasing it. But the original audio file could be yours <laughs> as an NFT. Could be done for sure. Could be done. Could be done. Well, gentlemen, I'll tell you what, I am so grateful for your time on this busy day. You have many things going on. And the fact that you took time to sit down and help me understand and help our listeners understand this amazing, interesting, scary, crazy, exciting, dangerous world of crypto billionaires and their NFT collection. <laughs> it's, it's exciting. Yeah, it really is exciting. My take on it is that I think blockchain, NFT, cryptocurrency, all this stuff, it's kind of like the internet in the late 90s, where we really haven't even begun to see how it's going to affect things and how it's going to change and touch everyone's lives in some way. And so it's really exciting. And I, I'm interested to see how this is all going to evolve and to hopefully be a part of it in some capacity. So, Tom, before we sign off, be sure to tell our listeners how they can find you. We're on social. We're on the interwebs. Can they find you? Yeah. So I'm on Twitter and Instagram at findtom, F-I-N-D-T-O-M. And you can check out Laura Zombie at Laura Zombie on most platforms and at www.laurazombie.com. See what we're up to. Fantastic. Mr. Waddles, where can uh, people interact with you on the socials? I'm just somewhere out there in the ether. So <laughs> Josh is being modest. He has a really awesome Instagram account with his photography. He's a very talented photographer. Yeah. So I'd recommend checking it out. Is it at Josh Waddles? Yeah, it's no. Joshua Waddles. Yeah. So few people are interested in having my combination of name that essentially everywhere I'm Joshua Waddles. <laughs> and Tom, you are right. As somebody who's a collector of Joshua Waddles photography, you are correct. People need to check it out because there's a lot of talent there. He's quite uh, mysterious and humble about it. He is. I think he's definitely pondering his entry into the NFT space as well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he's going to kill it. I mean, yeah. uh, I would, as a photographer, since I'm an old man and as a photographer for well over 50 years, the notion that you could create an NFT marketplace around still photography is just incredibly exciting in terms of opening up a new monetization possibility. I mean, it would just be revolutionary. It'd be fantastic. 
would you be willing to sell 5,000 days of your photos for $60 million or would you need to? I think so. I think so. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, yeah. They can have the copyright too, right? I don't think I have to think very long about it. (laughs) He's a bright guy. Particularly now that I've removed my head of prior wisdom and I'm working with my fresh mind, I might as well fill it up with something. 60 million (laughs) sounds like a good starting number. (laughs) That's definitely a good start. Yeah. (laughs) Well, then if that actually happens, Josh is taking us all out for dinner and he's picking up the tab, no doubt. Post-pandemic, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. By the way, I think the pandemic has a great deal to do with the NFT market bubble. You can't go out and shop. You can't go to galleries. I think it's really, I don't know how much of a significance it is, but we didn't touch on that. But I think the pandemic definitely has a lot to do with it. I think for a lot of people too, it's kind of merged our perception of real world versus virtual as well, which I think was a, personally, I think is a factor in it as well. It's really blurred the line between kind of the physical world and what they call the metaverse and the virtual world. Yeah. And it's where you go for emotional sustenance as well. Now you've got an entire world looking to the digital environment for emotional sustenance in a way that used to be satisfied by physical contact. It's just been supercharged. And maybe the NFT bubble is just an example of a transition caused by our having to all hunker down in the pandemic. All of this for me is just proof that the aliens have invaded us and are among us. And this is how they consume us. I could have a whole other podcast just on this topic that we're starting into now. It's really, it's really, it is really interesting. And when you get into just thinking about where things are headed and the digital and real life kind of converging in different ways and what that's going to mean. And the same way that you can ponder what does it matter, the physical item of an NFT being purely digital versus a collectible that you can hold in your hand. I think you can do that for a lot of different experiences, and a lot of different things. And It's the singularity, baby. It's the singularity. (laughs) Well, and, you know, you think about the main players. I mean, Bezos, Musk, Zuckerberg, they all want to get to Mars. Like, what's that about? They're lizard people, too. They're all lizard (laughs) people. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Shapeshifters, yeah. Uh, And they're all really good at math. They've got to be from another planet, right? Gentlemen, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Please come back. Great. Thanks, Scott. Cheers. Thank you. Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode, write a review and share with your friends on social. And if you haven't already done so, please press the subscribe button and follow us on Instagram at Not Real Art World. If you're an artist, be sure to apply for our 2021 artist grant at notrealart.com. Sourdough, out.